Hi there, friend. My name is John Werner. I used to be a part of the largest cult in the United States. After studying the Bible, Christian history, and ministry, I set my sights on confronting the problematic nature of white evangelicalism in the United States. In 2019, I published my first book as a first step in addressing the subtle issues of this complex system. This podcast will continue that work under the same title. Welcome to The Cult of Christianity. Content warning. While the cult of Christianity often deals with tough subjects regarding religious trauma and other triggering topics, some episodes may be more explicit than others. This episode contains content that may be distressing to some listeners. This may include multiple mentions of self-harm, suicide, sexual abuse, or other intense concepts. Please only listen if you are in the headspace to do so. Take care of yourself. On today's show, we have an author, a stand-up comedian, and a formal former or formal, I don't know, evangelical. Uh, he holds a Master of Divinity from New Brunswick Theological Seminary, where he graduated with honors. Uh, although he initially pursued a career in ministry, he ultimately came to reject the Christian faith. He has performed at San Francisco, San Francisco Sketch Fest. Uh, he hosted the fifth annual Timmy Awards and was featured. Uh, at the album recording for Make America Nate Again. <laughs> I can't wait to get this to know this guy better. Dan, welcome to the show. Welcome. Hey, thank you so much for having me on. Yeah, dude, thanks for coming on. Uh, really, really excited about this conversation. Um, first question I kind of ask every guest, just to kind of get a baseline. How did you relate to Christianity the first 18 years of your life? Oh, wow. Uh I started off in a very fundamentalist, like Baptist setting, because um, that's what m- many of my uh, relatives are kind of fundamentalist. And then, so that was like King James only kind of stuff. Uh, no drums, no contemporary music. Um, and then when I was eight, my family moved from New Jersey to New York, kind of a rural area. And eventually we started going to a still a conservative Baptist church. But for me, it was like, it felt like moving in such a liberal direction because it was like, Oh, they use the NIV here. (laughs) Um, And so I, I grew up conservative evangelical, but I was also like, kind of like already wrestling with fundamentalism stuff just as a result of that, that whole transition because of the way like, the kind of Christianity that my family has. And then what we had at my church. Um, So let's see, 18. So by the time I was 18, I was already started off at college. I was at Nyack college. Uh, I don't think I had yet started majoring in youth ministry, but that's what I, uh, I wound up studying to become a youth pastor. Gotcha. Um, So yeah, that's, uh, you might, I don't know. You might win for most fundamentalist guests so far. I've, I've had at least one other one. Uh, but whenever I hear King James only, I'm like, oh, deep cut, you know. Um, oh, you want to hear a real uh, deep cut? <laughs> this is the please, please do. This is the sort of thing where like I would tell people this, like the other conservative Baptists, and it would freak them out. <laughs> um, was because uh, I thought this was a normal thing when I was a kid. Was that because th- obviously we talked a lot about the rapture and all that stuff. And uh, when I was little, I would, I remember seeing in different places, like sometimes in people's houses and maybe in our church office, but I'm, I ha- I'm not entirely sure, but they would have like these glass display cases with a VHS tape that said, uh, in case of rapture, break glass. <laughs> what? <laughs> and I, my, my young mind was left to wonder what could possibly be on these tapes. And I now realize in in adulthood that it must have been so boring. <laughs> <laughs> well, like I I ha- I don't I've heard of a lot of I mean I, I part of my living is to hear crazy stories about Christianity. I don't think I've heard this one. Uh, 
Yeah, I've not glass found too and then many people. Find a, a VCR player. <laughs> yeah, because <laughs> hopefully Jesus would uh, come back before they started using DVDs. I guess. Um, yeah, they had to have panicked to the production company. Like crap, <laughs> we got to make a lot of DVDs. <laughs> we used up all of our money. <laughs> Yeah, now what would it be? Stream? Like yeah. what what we're what gonna live stream do? the rapture. <laughs> the the rapture will be streamed on, on Facebook. That's crazy. <laughs> um okay, so then I do know what you mean though by going from like um kind of this radical thing to something that is still radically conservative but doesn't feel as conservative. I can definitely uh relate to some of that. So but but you you feel like maybe that was planting some seeds of maybe more progressive type thinking. Oh yeah, I've actually I've thought about this a lot, and I I, I it's not in the book that I wrote, but it is something that I've like tried writing about. Um, that I I was basically like it, the way that I was taught to think about Christianity when I was growing up really like set me up to be very critical in the way that I thought about stuff. Because part of it was because of that transition, um, just by virtue of being put in a different environment where all the people around me were like, what? That sounds crazy. And I'm like, but, but it's normal to me. <laughs> um, and, and then other stuff like uh, at the fundamentalist church, I still remember when I was little in Sunday school, I don't remember like exact details. I just remember, uh, you know, the, the story in, um, in the book of Acts where Paul goes to a uh, city called Berea. And it's this whole thing about how he like preaches the gospel to the, the Jewish population there. And, um, and, but they didn't believe him right away. And I think in the King James, it says they were more noble minded. And so every day they would go back to scripture to make sure that what he was saying was true. And for whatever reason, that lesson, like, just like stuck with me so much at just such a young age where I was like, Oh, so we are not actually like, supposed to necessarily believe everything that people teach us and um and then yeah like just like things like that and then being encouraged by my conservative baptist you know environment to read c.s lewis and then being told that half of the stuff he says is actually heretical (laughs) just like wait that doesn't make sense why do we like him so much uh and so like uh i yeah it was like i had no choice but to have to like figure out what I thought because I was like, well, I obviously can't, can't just agree with everything because everybody disagrees with each other. And, and then when I started, you know, studying for ministry myself, you have to like learn where you like how to navigate different issues. And so you have to figure out which ideas don't make sense to you. Um, Yeah. So that's kind of, yeah, that was like kind of my, my part like a big part of my trajectory i guess i'll call it yeah that makes sense um you know but i i've talked with one of my best friends chris who is also deconstructed about like how you know the 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 cursed irony to them is you actually really do learn how to think critically on accident right (laughs) because (laughs) you're you're evaluating things through such a specific lens all the time and then like adjusting your lens obviously as you get older so yeah it makes sense that you kind of develop a critical mind even in what some would view as such an extremist group. Yeah. And it's funny, like, cause you were talking before we started recording about deconstructing. Um, I I've said, like, I've often said that, you know, by the time I was in seminary, I had gone, I had been in so many different denominational settings and I'd worked in a few different ones. And I just assumed that I was slowly figuring out which, like denominational context I would make the most sense in. And then in retrospect, what I realized is that I was just deconstructing the whole thing. Um, but I, I didn't, right. I didn't realize that for such a long time because I was just doing what I was supposed to be doing. Mm. Wow. Yeah. I can certainly relate to that. So, so is there like a plot point where you first start like seriously questioning? Like, I mean, everyone has doubts when they're a Christian and, yeah. and all, all of that, but was there, was there a point where you were like, oh, I might not believe it. I might be like leaving this faith. Was there any kind of plot point or was it gradual? How did that look? It was gradual, but there was like a series of moments kind of spread out. Uh, Because like the first big one was when I was 15 and uh, I got what one of my youth ministry professors called it a cerebral upgrade. Like when an adolescent gets old enough to start thinking about abstract stuff. 
Uh, and for me, I just remember like coming back from this one uh, youth retreat when I was 15. For whatever reason, I was just like suddenly thinking about like, you know, all the typical stuff like, wait, how do I know that God is real or why do I actually believe all this? And uh, and then I just started pestering all my teachers with questions and they finally I think I annoyed them because <laughs> they, they all finally just started, um, you know, giving me these like apologetics books to read. <laughs> Uh, and that wound up being right. my, yeah, that wound up being my gateway into learning about like philosophy and biblical studies and everything. And I got so hooked on it. And then definitely in college when I was, you know, uh, I had been a Baptist my whole life and Nyack college was an evangelical kind of like Pentecostal setting, but pretty much like every denomination was represented there, or it seemed like that, you know, and I was exposed to so much new stuff and so many new things to disagree with other people about. And then it was like towards the end of college when I started realizing, uh, like I, I started understanding all these issues related to the doctrine of biblical inerrancy, which is actually what um, the book that I wrote is all about. Uh, and that, that wasn't the reason why I eventually lost my faith, but it did play a big role in how I deconstructed it, if that makes sense. Oh, it totally does. I mean, inerrancy is one of those things that's always so, I think for, you know, at least relatively younger Christians um, that, uh, you know, you you just assume, oh, the church has always taught inerrancy. And then you look it up and you're like, wait, this is only how old? And not only is it, uh, you know, so new, but it also just is, it's kind of incoherent, right? Yeah, that, that was like, uh, that was the thing that really got me. And that's actually... Uh, that's why I wanted to write about it because I was like, the reason why this stopped making sense to me is because it doesn't like, it doesn't even work on its own terms. <laughs> uh, and right. And if you like, if you really get into conservative evangelical scholarship about the new Testament there, it is not what you would expect based on hearing your whole life. Oh, everything the Bible says is true. It's like way, you, there's just like so much, uh, I don't want to say nuance, but there's all these qualifications <laughs> and yeah. And then it just becomes a whole completely different thing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, so about uh, what a, I'll, I'll ask it this way. Was there an age where you stopped going to church? Yeah. So I, so let's see, I was, I started seminary when I was 24, I think in, uh, in 2010. And it was a three-year program. I I had been wrestling with inerrancy for a, a while, and it was about halfway through when I finally was just like, okay, I definitely don't believe this anymore. And at that point, uh, because there had been all these other issues I had been wrestling with, uh, it, it only took about another year and a half for me to like deconstruct the rest of what I believed. Um, and I actually, so I wound up realizing that I wasn't a Christian about a semester before graduating from the seminary. And I always fun when that happened. Oh, that's <laughs> that last semester was one of the craziest like parts of my life I've ever experienced. But, uh, but yeah, so like I had to, I had just finished all my field education stuff where you have to do like these internships. And I had had, I wasn't working as a youth pastor anymore. And, yeah, for pretty much like that last year, I like for my second to last semester, I was still visiting churches trying to figure out what to do. And then the last semester, I was really only just going to chapel at the seminary. <laughs> um, and and then once that was over, I was done. Wow. That's got to feel a little bit. Sick. I mean, not only, you know, for me, I had an undergrad that I had to just basically say, well, that was a waste of time. I can't imagine having oh. like a <laughs> master's degree feel a little bit like i i now, what did even, i just do there was there was like an extent to which it was a relief to finally figure it out and be like oh this is why this hasn't made sense to me for such a long time it's because i don't think i actually believe this but the last semester <laughs> um first of all obviously thought about like dropping out but I had uh, I had been doing really well at seminary and like my grades were good and I had gotten like uh, a pretty good scholarship and I was so close to the end 
<laughs> so it just felt like so unfair to be like, oh, <laughs> this isn't actually going no, to lead totally. to anything. <laughs> but I, I couldn't like bear the thought of just dropping out because I was so close to the end. So I was like, well, at least I'll have a master's degree. So yeah, I finished. But the last semester, <laughs> it was actually a semester. And then uh, I had to do one summer course to finish. But um. I had to do two preaching classes and I had to do, I had to write like an 80 page systematic theology of my own personal beliefs. Oh, wow. Which obviously, so I just went with like, uh, I just went with the beliefs that had been my own, like at the last right. phase of my Christian journey. I'm like, this is what I did believe. Uh, <laughs> and I had to do like a spiritual yeah. disciplines class and then a whole thing about um, Christ and culture and write all these papers about what I thought about that. And uh, and then there was even a point in the semester where the president of the seminary like approached me to talk to me about these three different uh, senior pastor positions that I could consider wow. and i had to tell him like oh i i can't do that but i couldn't tell him why <laughs> and, <laughs> oh man and yeah so only uh only a couple of people knew my ex-wife uh she knew uh and like two of my friends maybe and then the rest i was just like dying on the inside for like six months <laughs> man that's brutal i've definitely preached sermons i didn't believe and like i got paid to play worship music when i wasn't going to church otherwise and stuff like that it is such a like not fun feeling <laughs> to do oh. uh i'm gl- i'm glad i've cut all those ties now and no one would ask me now <laughs> i i mean i was glad that all my ministry like uh credits and stuff were done because i would i think that would have been too hard for me um so I don't know if I would have dropped out at that point, but like to preach for the class was fine. I will say the prof- <laughs> the preaching professor, I got like gym teacher vibes from him. Like he really didn't like me. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and I know he didn't like me because I had to do a, one of the assignments we had, we each had to do like a wedding sermon and I did one. Uh, I've only ever officiated one wedding. I did one that was like kind of similar to the actual one I had used. And mm-hmm. It's very, like, very much just, like, a whole, like, the whole, like, gospel, like, you know? Right. And just, but everything, like, just very rich with, like, scriptural references and everything like that. And he marked me down a letter grade um, in front of the class because he said, uh, well, it didn't really have the gospel in it. And the whole... (laughs) The whole class, this is one of the funniest things that I, at that point, didn't care anymore. So I wasn't going to defend myself. I was just like, whatever. And the entire class just like looked at him and was like, wait, are are you kidding? (laughs) And then they were like arguing with him on my behalf. And I was like, this is actually kind of amazing. (laughs) Wow. And if only they knew that I actually don't believe anything that I just said. (laughs) I'm sure you and I could honestly do an entire series on preaching class stories because they're pretty incredible sometimes. Yeah. Um, well, I have to ask, though, like, how do you, in as much as you want to answer this, uh, how do you view spirituality now? Uh, so I, so I've never been, um, I never became an atheist. Um, and I, like, I definitely, like, I, I mean, I opened myself to, like, w- once I lost my Christian faith, I was like, well, I mean, I have nothing to lose by just looking at everything and seeing what I think, you know? Um, but I had been like studying philosophy of religion for a long time too. And for a variety of reasons, uh, I just like atheism never made sense to me, but, uh, also like I, I'm like theism is obviously confusing. (laughs) Um, so I never became anti-religious, but I also knew once I left the church, I'm like, well, I'm almost certainly not going to join another religion. Uh, and I, I think, you know, for a lot of people, they seem to have like, um, like for a lot of people, like faith is a much more experiential thing. And for whatever reason, I'm just not wired that way. So I was always kind of more like cerebral with the way that I approach things. And, uh, for a long time, I felt kind of guilty about that. Like, cause I thought maybe like something was wrong with me, uh, but in hindsight, I'm just like, nope, there's just different personalities. <laughs> um, and so I, I've i never had any like significant religious experiences that I can identify. But I think if people do 
experience things. Like, I mean, I, I can't fault them for, you know, um, I, I guess like building a faith on that. You know what I mean? I do. Yeah. 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 I, I like, I say I'm spiritual and then people are like, what do you mean by that? And I'm like, no, I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> that's like, no, <laughs> that's going to, that's going to defeat the purpose of how my stuff works, you know? <laughs> um, but like, I, I think I agree with you that like, I'm also wired in the way that like, I can make myself think I'm experiencing things, but that's a little bit different than yeah. <laughs> experiencing them, if that makes sense. I mean, I definitely had like like experiences in um on like youth retreats and stuff that were very moving, but also I was a teenager, so <laughs> right. Like and and those events, I mean, I know from like having like also been a youth pastor for a long time that they're they're just it's very like easy to manipulate um very easy you yeah. know and i i was never on board with that even as a youth pastor so right. uh so yeah like i i just i just yeah i don't have those experiences but i did i i, I started my own podcast um a little while ago just to have an outlet to talk about religious stuff and mm-hmm. one of the things wh- one of the episodes i did was about the question uh do you believe in god and how difficult of a time i have answering that um yeah because same uh there's just like so many uh it's just not a simple question that you might think it's you know? really not and, and if, if it's I made into been... a simple if it's made into a simple question then it's like clearly dogmatic and problematic right yeah and it's I, and i've told I, i've acknowledged i'm like i know it's weird to say i know i'm not an atheist i'm not really an agnostic and also i'm very confused about theism <laughs> but i'd probably consider myself like a kind of theist if i had to uh sure but it's really more of like a philosophy than it is um, like a spirituality, I guess. Okay, cool. I can vibe with that. Um, well, so I know from your bio that you have, and I've, I've watched a couple of your videos and such, um, that you've done stand-up. So I'm just curious, like, what, when did you first uh, start considering doing stand-up? You know, a lot of people think about it, but only few actually go on stage and do it. Yeah, I well, actually, I mean... I always wanted to be a comedian. <laughs> my my dad sort of showed me he he showed me and my brother like a lot of the old uh, Marx Brothers movies when we were kids, and I got so hooked on them. And I just I like I I don't know if you've ever seen those. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, yeah. I was like obsessed with uh, Groucho Marx and just how like sarcastic he was with everybody. And uh, and then when I was in middle school, I started watching stand up comedy and by the end of high school i had i was like oh man i want to be a comedian but also i didn't really let myself go after it because i didn't really feel like nobody was telling me that i couldn't do it but i didn't really feel like that i could you know what i mean um especially because i didn't know like (laughs) like i i knew christian comedians but i didn't really want to be like a like a christian comedian where you like do your jokes and then you do an altar call uh oof yeah yeah so i had it like in the back of my head i i can't believe i lived like so close to new york city for four years in college and never went to an open mic but uh i it wasn't until after i it was actually it was like right um at the end of seminary like once i figured out that i'm not a christian that i wasn't going to be doing ministry i remember being pretty quickly like well i'm definitely going to try comedy now uh and it took me, it was about, uh, see, I graduated from the seminary in August of 2013. And then my ex-wife and I moved, uh, from where we lived to Baltimore. And I took about six months to kind of recover from everything that had just happened. And then I started doing stand up the following February. And, uh, that's, that was February, 2014. Um, and yeah, I just got like super hooked on it. <laughs> That's pretty cool. I mean, I, you know, me isogeting my own lens onto this. It sounds like you finally had the freedom to do something you wanted to do. Yeah. It's funny because I had always, like, I'd always been, uh, like, I was always doing my own creative projects uh, in my free time. You know what I mean? Uh, I, like, I made movies when I was a kid and uh, did, like, funny stuff like that with my friends. And, um, my last, 
uh, my last ministry job, it was kind of a job. It was more like an internship. And it was ironically at the uh, conservative Baptist church where I'd grown up, even though I told them beforehand, I was like, you guys know I'm not a conservative Baptist anymore. Right. <laughs> but I, uh, I needed a place to finish my field, my uh, field education for seminary. And they were very gracious in like letting me um, complete that at the church which is kind of amazing um, for like a conservative Baptist setting. And so my job for that last, was it a year? It might've been a year. I think it might've just been a semester. Basically my job was to put together um, a, a certain like, like they called it a multimedia worship service. It was a year cause I had to do one a month and it was basically to like take something that they wanted to talk about and build a whole service around it that, involved like uh you know uh music and visuals and drama and stuff like that and so i got to like take advantage of liking to do creative stuff and the only reason i bring all that up is because for one of them where we were talking about that i guess they were doing a thing about miracles uh because it was right after the whole uh, miracle on the hudson thing i think um i I don't remember whose idea it was, but it might've been mine. Cause I was like, wait, uh, can I like write a comedy sketch for this? <laughs> and it didn't, uh, and they agreed to it and it didn't have to be like a corny thing where at the end it was about Jesus or anything. It was purely just like to illustrate something that they wanted to talk about. So I got to like, I, I got to like write out this whole sketch specifically with a couple people from the church in mind who were like super enthusiastic to do it. and. And there was like no pressure about like putting a, a like a lesson in it or anything because that was going to be, you know, the sermon after the fact. And it was like one of them at that point, like one of the coolest things I'd ever experienced was just like watching these guys perform something that I had written in front of like basically a whole audience. Like the church was packed and uh, it went over perfectly. <laughs> and it was just like uh, I remember being like, oh, man, this feels really good. <laughs> But that's cool that, yeah, that opportunity actually came kind of in a, you know, comedy works in mysterious ways, I suppose. Yes. Like it's, it's interesting <laughs> that it, that it kind of happened in a church first. Um, let's zoom out a little bit, though. Uh, and, and, you know, nothing is funnier than talking about what makes things funny, right? Everybody always loves that. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> I, he said sarcastically as he could. But, but I'm curious, like, how, how would you generally describe what humor even is? Oh man. <laughs> uh it's obviously like the, a lot of it is subjective, but uh I I got really obsessed with uh so for the first year and a half that I did stand up, like I, most people are not great when they start <laughs> um and and so like a lot of people like when when you start doing stand up, you don't really know exactly how to write a joke or how to deliver it or how to read an audience or anything like that. And I got really frustrated for about the first year because my first couple of open mics, I did really well. And then for like a year, I just bombed a lot and I almost quit. And then I started like reading about from other comics talking about basically what I started calling the science of stand-up comedy because it turned out that there was all these uh, different methods and like all these considerations that don't even occur to, I, I would say like an average like comedy fan stuff. Like uh, I learned that like you have to try to get like, get a laugh every 18 to 20 seconds at least uh, other, otherwise you kill your momentum and uh there's all these different things that can trigger a laugh. And a lot of times it's just about, you know, misdirection and surprising people or, um, you know, weird comparisons and things like that. And just everything from like lighting to seating arrangements to like how you move on stage at, 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 like it all like plays a role in getting people to laugh. And I just got so interested in that. Uh, so humor to me is like almost like as much a science as an art where it's just like figuring out wow. like how to almost like trick people into laughing. Um, 
Yeah, it's very, it's very, I mean, you think of like court gestures or something like that. Like there is a lot of like trickery going on, right? Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, because a dictionary will just say something stupid like, oh, humor is amusement. Like, what does that even mean? Um, <laughs> but, you know, I, I, I think it was, I think it was uh, Calvin from Calvin and Hobbes who said uh, that like humor is just a reaction to awkwardness. Okay, yeah. Yeah, it's a release of tension for sure. Oh, release of tension. I like that. That's that's a cool way to put it. A lot of times it is building tension and then releasing it, but you can do it in different ways. Uh, and uh, and when you figure out a way that you're good at doing that, it's a lot of fun <laughs> to like to develop it. Sure. Yeah, you you already touched on this, but humor is almost subjective, right? Because I mean, obviously you know even 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 amongst the white guys who do stand up comedy even they have different styles you know um yes. and then you broaden broaden comedy out to all stand up and you're like whoa this is radically especially if you start looking into other countries and stuff and then if you zoom out further and don't just look at like comedians per se but humor just in like uh you know in everything in work presentations in movies in uh, literature and all these different things i mean yeah. it operates very differently depending on context it, it is kind of amazing uh actually so what's kind of funny is i've uh i've kind of joked with people about how like i i enjoy telling jokes on stage and then i wrote this book that has like almost no jokes in it and it's very serious and uh but when I when I first started writing I just assumed oh I'll try to incorporate comedy into this and so like I had like all these jokes like throughout what I was writing and then when I walked away from it and came back at a later time and reread it I was like oh my god this is painful <laughs> it doesn't like it's not the same it's like not the right context for it at all <laughs> Well, it's kind of funny because, you know, I've I've written a book and I have this podcast. And when I tell people I have a podcast, their first question is like, oh, well, what kind of podcast do you like? And I'm like, well, the type of podcast I like and the type of podcast I do are like two very different things. Yeah. <laughs> um, because all I listen to are like comedy and improv uh, like podcasts. And then I do something that I'm like, yeah, people get really horribly abused in this cult. And that's like, yeah. it's a, it's. <laughs> It, it's it's kind of funny to see it that way. Um, I want to I want to talk more about humor as coping a little bit later. But first, I'm just kind of going back to your story. You, do you, what would you describe your sense of humor as when you were a Christian? I guess the easiest way to explain it would be to like talk about the comedians that I liked a lot. Um, the first comedian that I ever got like really into which i'm kind of embarrassed to say now is uh jerry seinfeld just because it's like oh everybody says that um but I, I was i mean he's the archetype right yeah yeah but i mean when i was in middle school that show was like seemed so amazing to me and his stand-up sounded so funny to me just because you know oh you like point out like all this like weird shit that I guess people notice, but don't, don't always notice or whatever. And then, um, you know, I was like obsessed with the Marx brothers for a long time. And like I said, with Groucho Marx, just having like no respect for anybody and just being able to like, uh, just annoy the shit out of anybody. Just, I'm sorry. Can I, can I curse on this podcast? <laughs> I, I bleep them out, but only for comedic effect. So yes, you can okay. curse as much as you want. <laughs> uh, but yeah, and I also got really into like physical comedy. Um, it hasn't aged well, but I was really uh, into the old like Pink Panther movies. And I thought Peter Sellers was such a good physical comic. And uh, and then in high school, I got really into one liner comedy and like really absurdist stuff like with Mitch Hedberg and Stephen Wright were probably my two favorites. Um, oh, yeah, for sure. Mitch Hedberg. I mean, I'll, I'll give him a shout out. I mean probably the best to ever do one-liners i would that i can think of he was so good and and like probably like one of the greatest moments in my my own comedy career was just like there was a few times where after a show somebody would come up and tell me that i reminded them of him which if you saw my comedy it's not really very much like him it's just uh i do like short jokes and stuff too but it was kind of a nice compliment just cause like yeah <laughs> uh but for for before comedy, when I was a Christian, I guess my sense of humor was still kind of like I did like absurd stuff. And I was always trying to like, if I had to give a talk, I would try to like do jokes. And um, 
I, I, I would bomb in sermons. <laughs> <laughs> I've been there, actually. So, yes, I know what you're referring to. <laughs> and what's funny is I like probably the hardest laugh I ever got in a sermon wasn't even a joke that I'd written. It was just like a stupid throwaway thing that I was like, oh, that'll be funny to say that I'd heard other people say. And it was uh, my first sermon that I ever did. And it was just, I, I said something about the sad, I don't know if you ever heard the, the, the one where it's like, you talk about the Sadducees and how they don't believe in the resurrection. So they were sad, you see? And, and right, so right, right. I said that and this like uh, 80 year old woman in the back busted out laughing, <laughs> like <laughs> scream laughing. And, <laughs> and then everybody lost it <laughs> because it was just such a weird, funny moment. And uh, it completely so derailed wholesome. me. Yeah. It's such a wholesome thing to have an old lady laugh at like the dumbest pun. Ever. Oh, she loved it. She loved that joke. And then, it, of course, it tricked me into thinking, oh, I can be funny when I do this. And then I was like, never good at it. <laughs> yeah, I used uh, I used a lot of humor in my, you know, when I was in preaching classes and such, people would always give me like, you know, good feedback. Like, you're always you always have a good balance of humor. And I'm like, OK, whatever. You know, <laughs> nobody ever said that to me. <laughs> <laughs> You were being held back. I'm telling you, you were yeah. being held back. Um, here's a question, kind of along those. I, I, you know, you might see where I'm going with this, but we'll keep it general for now. Is humor inherently manipulative? That, well, yeah, but I, I'd say like it depends on what you mean by manipulative too, because it's not all like it's not like the bad kind of manipulation. <laughs> uh, but you are it is a little bit because you're like misdirecting people um a lot of times the way that humor works is by um setting something up and uh and somebody thinks that they know where you're going and then suddenly you hit them with something that they didn't see coming and uh it's kind of funny because when i started getting better at performing stand up, what I was doing was I would write any joke that I could think of, no matter how stupid, because I found that sometimes the really stupid ones would do well. So it, if like at a certain point, I stopped um, using jokes based on what I thought was funny, but I would just like throw everything out there at like different open mics and stuff and see what was working. And then if I really liked a joke that wasn't working, I would maybe try it a few more times than I should have. But yeah, eventually I would just like, I, that, I mean, that's kind of how it works. It's just, you just wind up with a set of jokes that usually work and usually make people laugh. And sometimes I didn't even understand why a joke would work so well. Um, it, it's, it's really weird. It's kind of just like, it's, that's why I say it's like kind of like a science to it because it's almost like, you know, you're testing different like st stimulants. <laughs> like if I stimulate the organism with this, what happens? Uh, <laughs> oh, they all laugh when I say this. Okay. Uh, and I mean, but then, you know, it also, as you do that, you do kind of figure out like why some things are funny and why some things don't work. Well, it's, it's interesting you put it that way. Cause that's almost how we, I think develop a sense of humor, right? Like when you're a kid, like you kind of, it's a lot of trial and error for all social cues, but humor is definitely one of them. You know, it's like, oh, this makes my dad laugh. This makes my mom laugh. This makes my friends laugh. This doesn't make my parents laugh. You know, that kind of stuff. This makes them laugh, but then I feel bad afterwards. <laughs> uh <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. No, like all of that, all of that stuff, it, 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 you're right. It is very um, experimental in that sense, right? Yeah. I, one of my, um, like this one example that I, I always think fondly of because when I started, I obviously wanted to be like an observational comic because uh, I think anybody who thinks who thought Jerry Seinfeld was funny when they were growing up thought that they could also do that if they were going to do comedy. And so I had all these things written down that I thought were really funny observations and most of them were not, but what, what I learned was that some of the things that I observed that I thought, oh, this is such a weird thing that happens. It would turn out like, oh, that's actually not a thing that happens to most people. <laughs> so like the one example was uh, I, I used to try to tell this joke about it's so stupid about how much cream cheese they put on your bagel at Dunkin Donuts. Because uh, I felt like every time I would get a bagel at Dunkin Donuts, it'd be an absurd amount of cream cheese. And I thought it was so funny and it, 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 nobody ever laughed at it because nobody ever understood like what the hell I was talking about. <laughs> 
that's a, that's a beautiful example of a bomb, right? Because it is so like, yeah, in your own self-contained world, like you can't get over how this always happens, and then you're then yeah, you try it out once, and it's like, no, nope, this yeah. is not. Oh, I tried experience. it way more times than once. I I did not. <laughs> I did not know how it worked yet. <laughs> you really hated that cream cheese. You were like, no, you're going to laugh at this. because like, they're is, just not hearing it right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I've I've never done stand-up. I've always wanted to do, you know, an open mic, just to try it out. Um, unfortunately, all my jokes I've ever written are about suicide. <laughs> and so, like, that's Oof, really yeah. <laughs> rough to come right off the bat. Just like, hey, guys, uh, I've never done this before. Let me talk about killing myself. I'm like, I don't really want to. Yeah, that's a tough that. one. I only ever did one joke that talked about suicide. It wasn't really a dark joke. Um, actually, it's weird because I, I forgot about this joke and just remembered it today. It's kind of funny that it came up. Oh, wow. Um, and it, it would it would go over well sometimes, but I think even just mentioning suicide would get people on edge. Um, right. It's like my joke was just about like, I'm not, I would start by saying, I'm not saying that I want to commit suicide. I'm saying that if I ever did, I would do it at the bottom of the ball pit at McDonald's and I would have a bag of Burger King in one hand and a piece of fabric in the other that matched the Hamburglar shirt. Uh, and it's just like <laughs> really weird joke. Uh, <laughs> that's, that's my kind of humor. I understand why that would, I, I'm like, that would bomb probably a lot, but I love it. <laughs> Sometimes it got like a really fun response, but, um, but I do remember an open mic, like a lot of open mics, for comedy are depressing already. They're very, very hard to right. see through. Um, and this one night, oh, I don't know what was going on this one night, but three people in a row did these really dark jokes about suicide. And I and <laughs> and it was hard to even call like them jokes for one guy. Right. One guy was like clearly just like talking through his thoughts. <laughs> and oh wow so the room like all the energy of this open mic just completely died and the guy who hosted the mic was like this really bubbly like friendly guy (laughs) and he so after the third person did suicide jokes he went up to like between between them and the next comic and he was like hey before i bring up your next comic (laughs) i just want to say if you're thinking about hurting yourself, <laughs> c- come and yeah. talk to me. I'll make you feel better. It's okay. <laughs> like that's this whole thing. Well, and- <laughs> <laughs> it's funny because like, I'm, just so you know, I'm sensitive enough. I'll throw a trigger warning at the beginning of this episode just for how little we've talked about it now. Yeah, yeah. Um, But like it, it's, yeah, it's this really dissociative thing though. But it, yeah, it kind of goes back to like this idea of, of humor being coping. Um you know, for many, humor is how they cope with like the hard things in life. And uh, for some, you know, that's also for some the reason they believe in Jesus. Um, so <laughs> do you think do you think like humor could be like unhealthy coping in a similar way that religion could be? Oh, absolutely. Because this is actually something um, that I've talked about a lot with my closer friends in comedy, um, especially so. When I started getting, not to toot my own horn, but when I did like finally hit my stride with comedy and like start getting better at it, I I had figured out that, oh, people really seem to like it when I talk about my anxiety. So I did a lot of jokes about having anxiety and everything. And it was um, my first time like kind of really figuring out how to do like personal stuff in, you know, as humor. And, um, but, because I was talking about mental health issues, uh, <laughs> I became like a little bit more sensitive to it. And um, like one time someone came up to me after a show and was talking to me about like, oh, I struggle with anxiety too. This meant so much to me. And at that point I had never, uh, I had not been going to therapy or anything. And I was like, man, I should probably like <laughs> take care of myself if I'm going to be doing this uh, just because like, this is something I talk about. You know what I mean? Um, and as a result of like having all this focus on my own mental health and anxiety and stuff and knowing other people who are kind of like in a similar boat in comedy, we we've like wound up talking a lot about how a lot of these people who show up at open mics to do stand up really just need to be in therapy. <laughs> um, 
And a lot of people use comedy like as their therapy and sometimes like forget that they're even supposed to be funny. <laughs> like they're just like processing some really intense shit on stage into a microphone in front of an audience. And it can get so like, there, like if someone knows how to do it, it can be so much fun to watch. And then if someone is like spiraling in real life it can be very tense but not in the fun way you know what i mean yeah well there's a cathartic element to it right um that's yeah it's like when they don't give you the re- like you have the tension but not the release then it's just like ooh. <laughs> yeah yeah that's a good way to put it like they just keep building on the tension and that's like people are laughing i assume because you know the tension keeps getting built and you're like preparing for the burst but if you're not careful the burst can actually be really destructive and not lighthearted not um not amusing yeah. <laughs> so to speak but rather really destructive it's kind of similar to the way that like some people use uh religion or a religious environment as an outlet for like I, there's there, there's always been like pastors who just clearly like to hear themselves talk you know what i mean almost all of them yes <laughs> and uh and that's also like there's a lot of I think a lot of people think that because they're doing comedy, their opinions sound really great. Uh, <laughs> and like they see themselves as like these cultural critics almost. And uh, yeah, there's a lot of that in stand-up too, where it's just like, oh my God, nobody cares. <laughs> no, it's so true. I mean, in in preaching classes, we talked a lot about the parallels between stand-ups and pastors uh, oh, really? like in class. Yeah, we in fact, a couple times we watched like stand-ups on mute um to like observe their gestures and how they engaged with their audience and 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 our pre our preaching prof would encourage us to like emulate that behavior you might be the only person who i could ask this to who might actually know what i'm talking about but do you know have you ever watched the stand-up of mike berbiglia yeah sure doesn't he like sound like a youth retreat speaker Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I I can't stand him personally (laughs) for that reason. (laughs) Exactly. I've seen him perform live and he's funny, but like I cannot listen to him because it just it's so triggering. (laughs) Triggering. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Totally. Total agreement. Um, You know, I'd be remiss if we didn't talk about uh, just briefly or we don't have to talk about him, but just mention like Tim Hawkins. Tim Hawkins? Yeah. Have you heard of him? I don't know. I don't think so. Okay, well, he's actually I'll, I'll I'll give him a brief shout out here. Like he's he's a Christian comic, but he's in my opinion the only funny Christian comic I've ever heard. Okay. <laughs> uh and but but it's funny because a lot of his comedy really is making fun of Christians. Okay. Um and I think that's why it kind of works, you know? Because <laughs> it's but it's a little bit them laughing at themselves, yeah. you know. Um I'm going to write his but name it, down. But it, yeah, I seriously recommend it. I will say he does a little bit of the altar callish stuff sometimes at the yeah. end. So that's whatever. <laughs> um, and yeah, he's not. I don't think he's like top ten funniest comics even. But I. But he was one of the first stand ups I ever watched. Like as a kid, um, you know, hanging out at a friend's house, and they were like, "Watch this guy." And oh, so he's been around for a while. Yeah. So he. Um, yeah, I think he started probably yeah, over ten years ago for sure, uh, if not longer. Um, and. Uh, yeah probably over 20 actually god i'm getting old um (laughs) but (laughs) yeah and and but it was fascinating because obviously yeah my parents had watched seinfeld so like i kind of knew about stand-up but he was like the first special i watched i think okay from from beginning to end i had heard some of uh 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 he must not be named comedy albums uh cosby yeah (laughs) i was just gonna say the first the first special that i ever watched was uh one of his because um that's what my dad showed us uh, Bill Cosby yeah. himself. Well, he was a staple at the time, obviously. Um, but yeah, so so the reason I, I brought up Hawkins was just to say, like, you know, c- Christians can be funny. Like, I met a lot of Chris- funny Christians, you know. Um, but it's it, do you feel like there's any difference between, like, what cracks Christians up and what... Do- I don't know. <laughs> it, do you see... Do you know what I'm getting at? Yeah, I mean... It- it depends on uh, the kind of Christian because I, I also want to throw out here that the first comedian I ever really got into that I <laughs> consciously omitted naming before was a Christian comedian uh, named Mark Lowry. Did you ever listen to him? No, I'm unfamiliar. He, I, uh, I don't know. <laughs> he, so he's like, he's like partially like a, uh, like a Southern 
gospel singer but also he would do stand-up and he has a really weird sense of humor and he would also do christian song parodies and when i was in middle school i thought it was really funny and in hindsight <laughs> you know not so much but my dad took me and my brother to see him when he did a show on broadway called mark lowry on broadway and uh yeah it's just like it's a whole thing but i think that like uh to go back to your question um <laughs> It depends on how jaded the Christians are, <laughs> like to like to see like what they would laugh at. Because I feel like the kind of audience that goes to a Mark Lowry show um, is also the kind of audience that will probably really enjoy like the blue collar comedy tour. Uh, and oh, he made a joke about how rednecks, you know, and their belt buckles and yeah. whatever. Like, and then. But I I know people through uh, I, who I met through the Baltimore comedy scene who I, I know a lot of ex Christians, but I also know people who would say that they were Christian, but also you're like you, you seem kind of crazy though, <laughs> right? Uh, <laughs> like like would they say you are? You know, <laughs> like or is that you just saying you're a Christian? <laughs> um, yeah. yeah, yeah, totally. Um, so yeah, can you can you speak any more to like I I agree with you that there are sometimes like parallels between like religious uh, you know i call them cults but religious cults and like kind of stand-up comedy communities yeah uh i mean unfortunately one of the things i i i figured this out pretty quickly (laughs) was uh the level of sheer like misogyny and uh and other kinds of like hatefulness that's disguised this humor where it's like, I'm not, I'm, I don't actually mean these things. They're just jokes. It's like, eh, you seem like you mean them. <laughs> uh, and I, having come out of, you know, like conservative evangelical world um, where one of the big, like the, the big things that were always coming up were like male leadership and sexual purity and stuff like that. Unfortunately, there's a lot of, uh, abusers and stuff like that in the comedy world too. And the comedy world has a, uh, is tends to reward and protect people like that. Uh, so it's not a fun parallel. (laughs) Well, the crossover almost seems to be, let's see, I'm going to put this as positively as I can, which is always a struggle. Best of luck. uh, it's kind of like this high value of free speech is like a big crossover right because evangelicalism really wouldn't exist (laughs) if free speech was like not so protected and kind of the same with comedy with at least in its current state comedy to some extent i I wonder if that may be some of where the values come in or something um obviously a lot of it is narcissism uh because well sure I mean, obviously, like stand-up comedy just attracts, like it, it's very appealing to people with narcissistic pos- uh, personalities because it's like one of the few places where you're allowed to just stand up and talk into a microphone for an allotted amount of time and say whatever you want, and people have to listen to you, <laughs> um, unless you know you say something so objectionable that the people running the show, you know, pull you off, but that you know that doesn't happen very often <laughs> and uh so people are like oh well if i if i get to talk then what i say must be important and um the way that e- a lot of evangelical churches build their worship services where it's like centered around this really long sermon written by someone that it, it's very often like delivered on the weight of their personality where it's just like They don't have to be an expert in anything or know what they're talking about, but they are the pastor. (laughs) And uh, yeah, it's just, there's, I mean, some, obviously some pastors are better than others um, and some comedians are better than others, but, uh, but yeah, a lot of narcissism, I think. Totally. Narcissism, exceptionalism, that kind of idea. Um, But there's also like the consumer or audience element of that. I mean, there's plenty of people who will never get up for an open mic but love going to love going to them and there's plenty of people who would never consider being a pastor but like you know go to church um i don't understand either of those groups but but (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> well, you and I are both talking into microphones right now, so like that makes sense that we wouldn't get it. But well, um, what I say is important. That's why I have to talk into a microphone. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, uh, I just need more uh, attention. Well, yeah. well, I think I do. Um, but uh, yeah, no, it's it's. But th- th- I think those parallels are certainly there. Um, and yeah, I think I think you know again like one of the things i would get complimented on when i was preaching was like my use of humor and now like looking back it kind of irks me because i'm like yeah my humor was like obviously tension release and it was good you know just delivering a good message right i mean like a good speech like technically a good public speaking um but it it's kind of it, it irks me in the sense that it was like you know, the best comedy, at least in, in my eyes and in, I think most people's eyes, is when you can balance coming from like a genuine place. I mean, there's plenty of absurdist and performative comedy that's also hilarious. But the thing that like kind of, I don't know, tickles your ear or if you have a soul kind of touches your soul is that stuff that comes from a genuine place. Yeah. And a lot of my humor when I was preaching, that is not where that was coming from. It was <laughs> I got to make sure the audience is still like listening, you know? <laughs> Yeah, when I did uh, a bunch of jokes about Goofus and Gallant in a sermon, it was not <laughs> not really reflective of anything personal. <laughs> was it coming from deep seated trauma? It was just like I don't know. It was just <laughs> confusing funny? everybody <laughs> who was listening to me. Man, <laughs> um, you know, here's here's a, here's a weird like special issue. This is kind of a niche issue in evangelicalism, but. In my experience with evangelicals, their sense of humor is either like, you know, super clean and like silly, you know, very lighthearted and not edgy at all. Or it's like deeply offensive shock humor. (laughs) Like, uh, do do you know why they flock to like such extremes (laughs) on ends of the spectrum when it comes to comedy? Oh, let me think. I feel like the so let's see, growing up in the Baptist churches, I feel like they were too it was unusual. It'd be unusual to hear too much humor. <laughs> um, I guess at college, yeah, a lot of the speak, yeah, that that is a pretty good way of explaining it. Yeah, sometimes it would just be like too like corny and everything, and then yeah, sometimes someone would come in just to like shake things up and, <laughs> and just say a bunch of outrageous stuff, and sometimes like in the form of jokes or whatever. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Have Have you ever uh, heard of Mark Driscoll? And Mars Hill Church. <laughs> I have spent a lot of time talking about Mark Driscoll. Yes. Okay, yes. <laughs> yeah. I he's definitely somebody I would associate with like shock jock type stuff. Definitely, yes. And also I'm not afraid to say a horrible person. <laughs> no, I'm not afraid to say it either. I've said it in as much as on this podcast. Yeah, Mark Driscoll's horrible. Um <laughs> and continues to be horrible, by the way. Um I but it. uh yeah, he I always I actually compare him to Trump more than anybody cuz he just reminds me so much of him. Um just like d- it's, he appeals to the same group um as yeah. far as I can tell. Um yeah, there's there's an element of uh I think the shock humor thing is just kind of I don't know if it's just so pent up from all the like cheesiness of Christianity or what, but like I mean in Bible college like you would run into people who you know, if I just made a silly joke making fun of a professor with glare darts at me, like, how could you say that? Or, like, I'd be watching Family Guy, like, with people, you know? <laughs> what I, and so, so it was just such an odd, like, where, why is it, it? It never felt, like, grounded in any way. It never felt like there were, like, parameters that made sense, I guess, to me. Yeah, I, I don't know funny. if I have an answer as to why that is. So, one of the more, um, like, one of probably the most positive experience I ever had working in any kind of like ministry capacity was uh, this one summer I got to be a camp chaplain at a summer camp in, uh, in Warwick, New York. And it, it was the, the conference center was uh, like reformed RCA um, associated with them. But uh, like this, the kids who would show up at the camp were just from like a, like a variety of Christian backgrounds and some were Catholic, some were like reformed and some were just like, you know, all over the map. And what I liked about it a lot is that they were really very much not where they're like, we're not doing like, we're not doing like these really like um, intense, like, uh, like youth retreat type stuff. We're not trying to like 
get anybody like worked up emotionally. Um, and we don't want anyone like it, it wasn't like a denominational battleground or anything like that. And so the summer I worked there was very much like an ecumenical type thing. And I, I had such a great time working there and there was like this really, um, open environment where kids could ask questions about anything. And then I was at a point in my life where I was like very much not about like, uh, putting anybody on guilt trips or scaring them or anything like that. And so in the course of, you know, all the lessons that I did there, I would try to do like a lot of, uh, like a lot of humor or whatever. And that's probably the most fun I've ever had in that kind of role. But I do remember <laughs> this one, uh, I guess it was a retreat that I did at the conference center that wasn't part of a summer camp. But um, for for one of the talks I gave, I was, I don't remember why I brought this up, but I just was like, I, I was using humor to like add levity, you know what I mean? <laughs> and the example, like the thing that I was using was about how the church where I used to go as a teenager uh, I said something about how like the guy who led the morning prayer every Sunday, um, if you closed your eyes, sounded just like Kermit the Frog. And <laughs> it just made the morning prayer at church a very interesting experience. Um, <laughs> and I made the mistake of pointing this out to people at the church. And then after that, I just like <laughs> caused the situation. But I did... Um, yeah. I did an impression of it because I can do a pretty good Kermit the Frog voice. And anyway, it went over well. And prove it. it prove it. Oh. Sorry, we don't allow that stuff on, on on the podcast unless you're willing to prove it. Yeah. Uh, so I, the impression I'd be like, so you close your eyes and be like, Near Lord, please be with the Hopper family today. Uh, so <laughs> shout out to the Hoppers. They're real people. Uh, That's what I'm uh, saying. That's what I'm saying. My goodness. Uh, anyway, so like after that talk uh, later in the evening, one of the youth leaders pulled me aside and like chastised me for making fun of someone in my church that they didn't even know. And like, like you were getting all the kids to laugh at him and they like made me feel so guilty. <laughs> and in hindsight, I'm like, why was I even like feeling guilty? <laughs> like, uh, right. It was not oh, even man. that bad. It's not, not even that mean of a thing. And I certainly wouldn't like tell people, Oh, his name was, you know, such and such. Right. 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 <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's incredible. My goodness. Well, and that's what's funny is if you were doing an impression of some sort of like atheist or something, I'm sure leadership would have loved it. You know, oh, yeah. it just goes to show where their heads are. Um, well, the leadership from that just, church, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Because if you were just saying, "Oh, I'm just doing Ray Romano," they'd be like, "Oh, okay, whatever." But <laughs> like, <you> could, <laughs> if Ray Romano yeah. led the prayer at church. <laughs> <laughs> It might sound something, something like, this. like this. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I was thinking the other day, what yeah. if this happened? Uh, yeah, I um, man, <laughs> sorry, I'm just reeling a little. Yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm, tem- I'm tempted to do my Elmo impression, but I don't think I will. Uh. Um, yeah. So <laughs> it's funny you should <laughs> say that because there was a guy at the uh at the summer camp, one of the counselors, who did a really good Elmo. So at one point, I forget. I forget somebody made us do this. It was like, uh, not like a formal during a service or anything. It was just like in front of the day camp kids. Like we had to like talk to each other as Kermit. <laughs> you see, like, and that's, uh, that's fun. I I know a lot of people have like really tragic stories about like Bible camp, but most of my Bible camp stories are actually like overwhelmingly positive, <laughs> like nothing have, dark or sinister. I have thankfully. nothing bad to say about that place, which I can't say about like a lot of the churches where I've worked. Right. Yeah. Sa- same for me uh, as far as the Bible camp I went to. Um, uh, I want to touch on this a little more. <laughs> a hard pivot. Uh, <laughs> I want to talk about, um, you know, you brought up earlier how there's like obviously like toxic masculinity and like preserving of the patriarchy that happens in comedic spaces. Yeah. Do you think it's as heinous as it is in Christianity? Uh <laughs> The reason I laugh <laughs> is because I've sometimes wondered if it's worse. <laughs> uh, really? It's, it's, it's really, I mean, it's really hard to say. It depends so much. Like the thing, like the thing that makes, uh, the thing that makes patriarchy in the church so, uh, harmful is because 
of how big of an institution it is and how much power it has. But man, like comedy clubs just in general are such unsafe places <laughs> for, I, I mean, not every comedy club, but like, my God, like a lot of comedy clubs are just very, the stories that come out of them. And I'm not going to name anybody, but like, I know about comedians who are still like, successful or doing well and loved by a lot of people who have just like openly assaulted like waitresses waitresses at comedy clubs have done this multiple times multiple witnesses and they're still like there's no repercussions at all and even in my church like as soon as the one where i grew up as soon as there was a hint that um one of the students was was unsafe like i mean it was a lot of like conservative white people but like a lot of them like took it seriously and took immediate action you know and that's much rarer in the comedy world at least in my experience um so i i honestly don't know which i'd say is worse <laughs> it's hard to well, say I, that's that's interesting because i mean i think you i think you nailed it that like the key distinction's got to be the institutionalization aspect right because like that's that it kind of explains it both ends on christianity like you'll see this gets brought up a lot because usually obviously i have a book and a podcast called the cult of christianity so everybody when they want to approach me want to be like tell me the salacious details i'm like it's not always salacious that's usually not what i'm talking about but there's obviously a lot of the gross salacious abuse that happens um yeah and and i also i don't want to like uh paint too rosy a picture of how it played out at my my home church uh (laughs) sure obviously like a lot of issues came up uh and right and it was not all handled well and there are a lot of churches that are much more like there was a small like bit of trying to cover their asses at the church um yes it they didn't work they weren't good at it so it didn't like succeed but (laughs) Like obviously there are I've churches. heard that story a lot <laughs> where it's like, hey, we have this policy to protect our image, and then it just doesn't. Yeah, work. like immediately, like yeah. But I obviously there are churches that work very hard to protect like abusers. So I don't want to like, I I, I don't want to say that that doesn't happen because it obviously happens all the time. But uh, but yeah, it's just I can't. I can't overstate how bad it is in the comedy world. <laughs> so, well, I, I wonder if the comedy world is almost like the Wild West a little bit more. You know what I mean? Where it's like that's th- there's not really as much of an infrastructure to deal with anything other than like you know like well that's the thing each like club's decision I guess but that's so about it's all, it. like when I've talked about it with people like the word that we use a lot is gatekeepers like there's gatekeepers in comedy and most of the time they are um like men white men and do not like more way more often than not do not give a shit about like the safety of women or the safety of like trans people or anything like that so mm-hmm. and and then like i mean if you look at like the kind of comedy that gets rewarded <laughs> uh like i'm i'm going to talk about dave chappelle just a little because he like Go the for last it. He he's obviously said a lot of like problematic stuff about trans people, and then in the last special that he did, he just doubled down on it. And it, and it, at this point, there's no excuse because so many people have just, especially people from the trans community, have like explained why it's so harmful. Like it's not just oh he's just saying his opinions. Like no, actually this has real devastating like tangible effects on the trans community, and he doubled down on it. He said some more problematic stuff and I don't know if you saw that this was like a headline that came up within the past month or so, but Netflix has signed him up for four more specials. So <laughs> I four? Yeah. Four That's more That's speci- crazy. Yes. And the other thing was like, you know, his he was talking about like cancel culture, like cancel culture kept coming up. All these trans employees at Netflix who who um like spoke up about it got fired so i like i i'm like when people like when certain people in comedy complain about cancel culture whatever i'm like eh, i don't think you really understand who's getting canceled or what it looks like truly though yeah and yeah so it is no it is truly like almost like there is an institution kind of there but it's obviously not the same as um 
one that's been around for 2000 years. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Yeah. That, that's I, I, yeah, I agree with so much. I mean, I, you know, I don't, I don't, first off, Dave Chappelle's not funny. Sorry. Hot take. Um, but he's not that funny. I know a lot of people um, who'd be very angry with you, but I, I agree with you hundred percent. So <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't get it. I don't get it. Um, I, they're like, he's this legend of, I've like, I've tried, I've, I, th- I watched like a couple of his specials, I think. And I was like, yeah, this is oh, not, great. I have learned like not to hold anybody up as a legend anymore. And like so many yeah. of the people who I considered legends have turned out to be such horrible people. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <Seinfeld>. And, and, <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. No, he's, he's kind of a jackass. Um, but um, <laughs> yeah, th- th- there's, there's that element. I think again, like, w- you know, trying to relate it back to, to Chris, that's actually such a, there is a parallel there, right? Because there are p- these pastors who, uh, you know, I think you can get away with saying, a lot in stand-up comedy and you can get away with saying a lot as a pastor but i think you can actually get away with saying more things as long as you know how to do it subtly from the pulpit than anywhere else on the planet i think Mm. you can get away with saying the craziest things um and and some really hurtful and harmful things and uh yeah it might be because in one context you're i mean you can get away with presenting it as if it's like um the word of god (laughs) I I know I know a lot of comedy settings where where you can like a, a white guy can get away with saying the n word, although it is like right. uh, obviously like frowned upon by a lot of people. Uh, sure, which I don't know of any church. Well, I'm I'm sure there are some, but I'm saying I haven't really encountered any churches where that can happen. But uh, right. I do know churches where things are presented as like uh, as divine commands or you know god's will or whatever that are extremely harmful even though they're not using racial slurs or anything like that so uh i don't know it's almost a culpability (laughs) thing right yeah because like you know you can be like well i didn't say that the bible did and you're like yeah um (laughs) but uh yeah whereas like a comedian there's some element of having to own like well i just speak my mind blah 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 like there's still an element of onus i guess on them uh, they might uh, they still sometimes project it back to like the sacred art of comedy, which always makes me laugh. Um, My favorite is uh, the the paradox of saying like comedians are like the last truth tellers, speak truth to power, blah blah blah. <laughs> they're but then absurdist. They, but then if they get in trouble, they're like, but they're just jokes, <laughs> right? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah Schrodinger's comedian. Yeah, um, <laughs> yeah. That's uh, that's yeah. I agree. Um, all right, so let's get into the meaty stuff. I think evangelicalism is generally disinterested in uh, humor. I really don't think they're that interested. They only like it as like a lure or like a manipulation tool to get people to pay attention to their message and hopefully get them to join the cult. All right, what do you think? Is that too harsh an accusation? I've never really thought about that. I like for someone like uh, Mark Lowry, the comedian I mentioned before, my sense of him is that the humor was like a big deal for him um but generally speaking like when i think about youth pastors who were who i thought were really funny or like those uh retreat speakers or the people who would show up to talk for spiritual emphasis week or anything and they some of them could be so good at like making you think they were so funny and cool and everything but yeah it was all just as a way of like lowering your defenses and then hitting you with this really gut punching message about how you're like uh not living up to god's standards and you need to you know turn your life around and stuff like that and that does seem very manipulative to me and i don't like some of those people sometimes i would get to know them a little bit in real life and be like you're not as funny in real life (laughs) oh yeah i mean i heard jokes from you know my cohorts in preaching classes that i was like wow what a what a brilliantly crafted joke and then you talk to them outside and they just start being misogynistic who aren't even funny and you're like what like it's a (laughs) yeah it's crafty i mean you know crafty as a serpent dare i say um Ooh. and uh <laughs> yeah um but but yeah i that's that's you know i i generally think of evangelicalism as a cult that doesn't mean there aren't you know disclaimers throughout right good christian people fun christian people all those exist um but you know the the anomalies don't 
don't discount the majority, right? Um, yeah, well, cult, cult like, cult like, uh, or like a cult mentality can turn up in almost any context, but especially, I mean, obviously with like religious stuff. Well, anywhere there's leaders and followers, right? Like yeah. that's kind of how I see it. Um, so yeah. Um, what one last question I'll ask is just: Do you do you find yourself? Um, I, I mean, probably you you would say you're funnier now that you're not a Christian, right? <laughs> um, uh, I think I'm funnier now that I've like, like I think I got funnier like working on it as like a skill. <laughs> uh, gotcha. Yeah, but I don't know that it was necessarily leaving the church that made me funnier. <laughs> That's fair enough. Um, do you, so yeah, well that that might actually that that kind of makes sense to me because I again there are funny Christian people. Um, but I guess, I don't know what why do you why do you enjoy making people laugh? Like for you personally, what what do you and do you think do you think that uh, kind of uh, ethos would be di- different now making people laugh now than why you would want to make them laugh? previously yeah so it's a good question because i've i've thought i've thought about a lot like why do i like doing this and i i actually used to have a joke about it's it's weird that i like doing stand-up comedy like i love doing stand-up comedy because i love making people laugh which is weird because i don't even like people (laughs) Uh, right and i all i know is that like like my early experiences of being able to like get a crowd of people to laugh like once i felt that i was like oh i like this a lot (laughs) um and there i don't know like i I couldn't tell you like exactly what it is that i like about it it's just like it's fun to be funny you know um and it's it's really fun to get better at being funny like to know like to get to a point where you can have a pretty good certainty with certain um scenarios where you're like oh i'm definitely gonna make these people laugh you know <laughs> um like that feels like really exciting to be able to do that and then of course when you do bomb sometimes it's like oh i suck <laughs> uh but uh it's it's funny because i it has changed a little bit for me in the past couple of years and i don't perform as much like i really don't perform that much at all right now and part of that was because of covid um and there was like all this other, you know, personal stuff that I was dealing with. And uh, I haven't gotten like fully back into it yet, although I've done a, a few shows in the past year. Um, and I'm kind of in this place of uh, trying to figure out if I still like it or not. Um, and I don't uh, I haven't really been able to figure it out yet. Wow. I mean, that's thank you for sharing that. I appreciate the honesty there. Um yeah, do you think that man? I'm so curious about that. I I, I don't want to pry too much though. <laughs> um, but, but uh, yeah, okay, cool. Well, Dan, um, is there anything else you want to say just about how you view humor, uh, kind of outside Christianity or inside Christianity? Any closing thoughts on that on that end? Closing. I can tell you my favorite joke about Baptist people if you want to hear it. Oh gosh, yes, that'd be perfect. I did not write this, by the way. Someone told it to me when I worked at the summer camp, and I just like love it so much. So it's uh, how come you never take only one of your Baptist friends fishing with you? I don't know. (laughs) If you take only one of your Baptist friends fishing with you, they'll drink all your beer. But if you take two of them, they won't drink any of it. That's good. Well, man, that's good. That's a <laughs> good it. joke. You heard this? At, did a kid tell you this joke? Or oh my <laughs> god, no, no. One of the other counselors. <laughs> I, mean, I was imagining like a six-year-old kid, like <laughs> just tugging at your shirt, like I got a joke, and then just says that. That would be like the best um, thing ever. <laughs> <laughs> I I can see it. Well, Dan, uh, tell them. You know, plug away. Tell people where they can fi- buy your book, find you, all that good stuff. Sure. Yeah. I um. So I just wrote my book uh my first book came out in december politely rejecting the bible (laughs) um and uh it's actually been really fun so that's available like on amazon and uh barnes and noble and apple books and in a it is available in like a bunch of smaller smaller like sellers who i don't know if you don't want to support like bezos or any of them um but uh and then i i started a podcast to talk more about like 
religion stuff and philosophy called uh, the whole God thing. And nothing special, but it is a fun outlet for me to kind of like uh, talk through some of the stuff that I think about all the time. Um, and then in general, I guess I, I'm on Twitter at Dan has jokes. Awesome, Dan. Well, thank you so much for coming on. I really enjoyed this episode. Yeah, thank you so much for having me on. I had a blast. Awesome. And thank you, listener, for stopping by. If you wish to learn more about what's going on in my life or wish to purchase my book, go to thecultofchristianity.com. If you'd like to support this podcast, please continue to listen, follow, share, and consider subscribing for additional content. For only five bucks a month, you'll have access to two additional shows, Parsing Propaganda, where I review and critique Christian content, and Art, where we try some amateur religious trauma therapy. Every subscriber becomes a part of something bigger than this podcast as we endeavor to hold churches accountable, speak the truth boldly, and most importantly, love others despite our pain. Thank you for listening, and remember to keep love in your life, hope in your heart, and searching in your soul.